Stay tuned to PBS 39 as we put the focus on arts in the latest edition of our monthly series, First Fridays on Focus. The ordinary becomes extraordinary in the care of this Bethlehem-based artist who uses ancient techniques and an exquisite eye for details to bring life to his paintings. Plus, a new school year begins in a new school building for the Lehigh Valley Charter High School for the Arts. We tour the newest arts venue in South Bethlehem. These stories and more coming up right now on First Fridays on Focus. Focus is for our community. Focus showcases the people, the places, and the issues that matter to you. Focus on what matters. You never know what you're going to see when you tune into Focus. Support for Focus is provided by Univest, Banking Insurance Investments, Fellowship Community, Continuing Care with Spirit, the Martin Guitar Charitable Foundation, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. I'm Laura McHugh. In this episode, we turn our focus to the arts as we do the first week of each month. Our first story features a nationally renowned artist based right here in Bethlehem. For more on this local treasure, here's Focus reporter Grover Silcox. Thanks, Laura. Douglas Wiltrout loves the passage of time and its effect on people, places, and objects, particularly those in his own life. He savors the fleeting shaft of light streaming through time and space. His paintings capture that light and the corresponding shadows in a signature way that has earned him recognition throughout the country. Here's more on Doug and his art. When most of the world goes to sleep, Doug Wiltrout goes into action. I find the things that I'm gonna paint during the day and execute them at night when it's totally peaceful in here. In a small studio on the second floor of Bethlehem's Banana Factory, artist Doug Wiltrout leans into his work, surrounded by the images of people and scenes he's captured in time. I really love the passage of time, um, the effects of nature on man-made things and on us ourselves. Doug, an award-winning artist, exalts the everyday people, places, and things in his life through his paintings. This is a portrait of my father titled Family Man. He raised five kids, built his own house. He was painting on his garage that day. When he stepped out into the sunlight, it was another presto moment. Pop, don't move. He just symbolized the family man to me at that moment. 20 years later, Doug captured his dad, Richard, a U.S. Navy veteran, in yet another defining moment in a painting called Old Salt. That's where that momentary shaft of sunlight comes in. It just will elevate the commonplace to the extraordinary. Doug's sense of detail gives his paintings the illusion of reality. Details within the shadows is what really makes it believable because in real life, it doesn't matter how dark an area is, if you look there, you still see things. When painting a portrait, Doug begins with a subject's face. Once he gets that right, he completes the scene. This painting of his son Jonathan serves as just one of many examples. He just sat down on this big stone sill of the doorway to cool off. The sun was setting over the Lehigh River. I just thought, this is a, a beautiful scene. It's my sun. The sun is setting. I'm going to title it Setting Sun. Doug paints primarily in watercolors and to achieve his style in the ancient method of egg tempera, combining egg yolk, water, and paint. It goes back to the Renaissance. It's a fantastic medium for portraying light and shadow. The process begins with a real egg. I have a single yolk, which is good because sometimes you'll get a, a twin and it makes it more difficult. Gently sliding the yolk from palm to palm, Doug's careful not to nick the sack. He continues this process till all the white is gone and only the yolk remains. 
This is where you pinch the edge of the sack and lower your hand and you can actually hold the egg sack. As Doug proceeds, one can imagine the ancient Egyptians or Renaissance masters using similar techniques. And then you put it over your dish and pinch it and let all the egg yolk just drain out because you don't want to use the sack. That is what we use to paint with. Now this will get mixed with 50% water. And this is what they call a natural emulsion. Egg tempera creates glazes. Very, very thin glazes. Uh, starting with your lightest colors and, and building the layers up, almost like colored cellophane. And so you end up getting a luminosity from within. With what he calls tunnel vision, Doug works on one painting at a time. He has spent three weeks so far on this one, which is destined for a show in New York City. It's a show called 12 American Realists, and they requested that one of the paintings be inspired by New York City. I decided to do a painting of this Empire State Biscuit Works New York City box. It's from the 1880s. He associates the box with his father-in-law who grew up on Staten Island and spent a lot of time in New York City. As always, Doug finds the muse in those closest to him. My mother encouraged me almost on a daily basis. She was approaching her 70th birthday. She was back in the woodshed at home. I was just taking some photos of her, not saying why. And then when it became her 70th birthday, I presented her with that painting and titled it Sweet 70, like Sweet 16. And how did she respond? Oh, uh, with, with tears. Doug never got to paint his grandmother, Marie, but he found a way to remember her in his painting, Tools of the Trade. I knew I wanted to do a painting of this rag mop, which was something that I'd see her use when I was a child. And as soon as I saw that, I knew it was the perfect image. Meredith E. Lewis, a watercolor artist, wrote that Doug's paintings overwhelmingly express reverence and wonder at the space, time, and place of their subjects. The act of painting, at least to me from the very beginning, was pursuing creating objects of beauty. And you can only hope that in the end that you've added to that definition. Doug has been adding to that definition for more than 40 years. As a nationally acclaimed artist, who takes the commonplace and makes it extraordinary. For Focus, I'm Grover Silcox reporting. Thank you, Grover. From ancient painting techniques to visions of the future, our first guest brings us the science fiction art form known as steampunk. Daniela Romano is a guest curator for the Kemmer Museum of Decorative Arts in Bethlehem, and she's here to tell us about its latest exhibit. Daniela, thank you for joining us. Hi, Laura. Great to meet you. Some of our viewers may not be familiar with the term steampunk in this art form. Describe mm -hmm. it for us. Well, they're actually familiar with the visual, even if they don't know the term steampunk. This is a science fiction literature literary subgenre um, that draws on the Victorian era, so women in uh, fine gowns with bustles and men in top hats project that classic look into the future as we develop new technologies and um, kind of project that science fiction into the future. You specifically, for example, mentioned Hugo to me, that that's a very yes. common um, vision for many people when they right. think of steampunk. Hugo the film, um, Sherlock Holmes the film from 2000. 2010, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. So those are all examples of yep. steampunk and pop culture. Exactly. Why bring this exhibit to Bethlehem? Bethlehem has got the perfect backdrop to look at the future projected through the past. We've got the extraordinary Bethlehem steel blast furnaces right here behind the building. A lot of incredible artisans in the region, in the local community. I've brought a couple of pieces to show you today. Um, one piece is in the exhibit and another piece is 
for sale in the gift shop so people can bring a piece of the exhibit home with them. So let's start with this. You said this is a jetpack. Yes. This is what uh, an artist imagined a jetpack would have looked like. Right. And the artist is Ed Kadera. He's based in Maryland and he has an incredible body of work. He collects antiques and welds them together into these kind of fantastical fabrications. This is a jetpack. It's an antique fire extinguisher that's been welded, weld attached to um, horns, a garden hose, some electrical conduit, and if you can imagine strapping this onto your back and blasting off to work every morning, <laughs> then you might be somebody who thinks about <laughs> steampunk, the look, and kind of wants to live in that fantasy world. So this is just one piece from mm -hmm. the exhibit. Tell us about what people will see when they come into the Camera Museum. They'll see great examples of fashion. We have another artist, Heather Hutzel, who has designed an extraordinary parachute dress with a bustle. and It's um, very kind of couture design. It's got little pocket watches all attached to it, and it's made from World War II parachute silk. They'll see other examples of metal sculpture, um, including a showcase of some pieces by a historic Bethlehem blacksmith um, and that's a nice actual call to action maybe for your visitors they can kind of go st see steampunk in action by visiting the historic Bethlehem blacksmith shop in the old industrial quarter. And they have the opportunity as well to take pieces of steampunk home exactly. and bring it into their own decorative arts in their own home. Yeah. Tell us about this piece. This is another local artist in Allentown. His name is Ron Gutman and his studio is Studio 7. This is a hot air balloon. It's all completely hand fabricated from paper um, with a little bicycle. So I guess you'd be powering your hot air balloon with a bicycle ride up in the sky. <laughs> and you can do that um, by placing it maybe over your mantelpiece or somewhere in your house. How have you, how has the exhibit been received so far? Really well. People have been coming from all over. Steampunk has got a huge fan base. So people have been visiting from New York, Philadelphia. We've had some visitors from overseas. A lot of locals are coming to look at historic Bethlehem kind of through a, through a new lens of this steampunk fantasy. It's been really well received. And the exhibit remains on exhibit until the end of October, correct? Yes. All right, Daniela, thank you so much for joining us and for Thanks bringing so the exhibit to us. Oh, it's wonderful. Thanks. In our next story, we welcome the Lehigh Valley Charter High School for the Arts to the Steel Stacks neighborhood in South Bethlehem. A new school year recently began in a new school building, and Focus reporter Brittany Garzillo was there as students walked through the doors for the first time. Brittany? Thanks, Laura. Less than a month into the school year, and it's already been a momentous year for the students and staff at the Lehigh Valley Charter High School for the Arts. These aspiring artists have a new place to call home, and while they're still settling in, remain tied to traditions of their history. Happy for some, a red rose is a symbol of love. For students at Lehigh Valley Charter High School for the Arts, good morning. It's a sign of the first day of school. It symbolizes like a fresh start. And a tradition that dates back to when the school first opened 12 years ago. I think that that's just kind of a remarkable tradition and it says something about that first day and it helps you to remember what happened with every single student that walked through that door. While some students celebrate the start of a new year with a warm embrace, Executive Director and CEO Diane LaBelle celebrates a moment that's been years in the making, the opening of the school's new location in South Bethlehem. Well, with this facility now, everything is possible and anything is possible. Formerly located in a renovated warehouse on East Broad Street in Bethlehem, the Lehigh Valley Charter High School for the Arts has attracted students in 12 counties and 45 school districts throughout Pennsylvania since 2003. Today, the four-story, $27 million facility sits on the corner of East 3rd and Polk Street, just steps away from the Steel Stacks Arts Campus. Now we get that added component of being part of an arts and cultural and educational community. The 91,000 square foot school includes state-of-the-art music, art, and dance studios, various classrooms, 11 practice rooms, 
and a 350 seat theater. I think that this facility is exactly what these students need to really experience their arts and their core curricular education to the fullest. Each of the 575 students who auditioned and were accepted into the school partake in one of seven majors. Instrumental music, vocal music, visual art, theater, dance, literary arts, book. and figure skating. Our mission really is for every student to use their arts to become successful. Our hope is that every student that walks through our doors will leave after their experience here and be successful in the world. That's the hope for students like junior Gabe Moses. I want to become a professional actor and a director. Each school day, Gabe commutes about 40 minutes from his home in Bangor to pursue a major in theater. A busy good day. I just always loved acting. I loved entertaining and making people laugh and just connecting with the audience. But the point was Gabe was the one catching her. As a theater major, Gabe spends half his day in his major classes before breaking for lunch in the school's Commons Cafe and then heading to his core curricular classes. We are serving a portion of our community who truly needs the work that, and the, the curriculum that we offer, the environment of acceptance that we offer. And consider how that makes you feel. Diane Wagner, the school's director of theater, helps students like Gabe perfect their craft. He really typifies the um, charter arts theater student, which is there is a different level of maturity, professionalism, and just a general sophistication. To shake that all out, all that character stuff out. Art, it talks to everyone. It's not just for one specific group. Any kind of art, um, theater, music, um, singing, dance, it all reaches out to people. Keep pressing down in the plie, down. Good. Upstairs, artistic director of dance, Kim Maniscalco, passes along what she calls her very first love, ballet, to a classroom full of hopeful performers. Nowhere else will they get dance history, um, composition at the level that they're getting it here. Up seven, we're going to bring it to flat. She guides students through each delicate balance. motion. Where motion senior Sophia Blasco from Bethlehem has been practicing since she was eight years old. Dance is my life, it's my passion, it's what I do. I, I couldn't live without it. For Sophia, this new studio provides an outlet for self-expression. It's gorgeous, it's really easy to express ourselves. We have the windows and it's light. I think for the students too, inspires them to do their best and we're looking forward to many, many years here. Though arts are at the heart of the school, not all students that graduate go on to pursue a career in their majors. It's interesting that probably less than 20% of our students go on to conservatories in that particular art. Most of our students go on to be engineers, they go on into the medical profession, they go on into being attorneys, teachers, just about anything that you can imagine uh, our students participate in. Regardless of what paths they pursue after high school, Diane's passion for arts education is clear. I believe that the arts are part of who we are as human beings and being in touch with that part of us is what makes us in touch with humanity. And with the right touch in high school, a love for the arts that can blossom throughout their lives. For Focus, I'm Brittany Garzillo reporting. Brittany and Grover join me for our next segment along with guests from the Allentown Art Museum. Julia Marsh is the museum's curator for community engagement. She's brought with her Jill Odegaard, the chair of the art department at Cedar Crest College and the artist behind a new piece called Woven Welcome. Thank you so much both of you for being with us today. Thank you. Jill, can you describe Woven Welcome for us? Well, Woven Welcome is a community engagement project, an art project using weaving as a metaphor for community. And I have designed the project to Think about weaving, the structure of weaving, where the warp is 
really symbolic of the infrastructure of a community, the, the places we go, schools, libraries, museums, businesses, for-profit, for non-profit. For non and then we as individuals are interacting each day with our community and so we weave into the fabric of our day. Julia, how has this been received? Overwhelmingly uh, positive response from the public. We've had um, at this point over 200 events out in the community and inside and outside the museum we've interacted with almost 9,000 people. Well, we really want to contribute as well, so that's why you brought the loom with us today. Will you teach us how? Absolutely. So it's, it's participatory. It's engagement. It's getting people to connect and have dialogue. So it's been designed where there's conversations across the loom. And so essentially what we do, it's very simple. We go over and under. And I'm going to go halfway, and then I'm going to ask for help, it. which okay. you do in you community, go working together. And then, and then so it's just over under, over simple. Under, Anybody over can under. do this. And then when you okay. go under the last one, the last you're going to you pull the fabric through, like you're fishing, going through a fishing like, just line. Just like this? Yep. Okay. And you're going to keep pulling. It's sort of a little magician's act. You're pulling the scarf through. Team effort, Grover. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> and I like the pull, purple and the lace through. on this okay. thread. So all of the and fabrics have been pull, pull, pull. donated. Okay. okay, and that's enough. And then we push the oh, fabric down like this. Yeah. <laughs> and then you take the tail oh, of the fabric, and, then you and you're going to weave back to me. Stuff. Okay. And then so do I start like with this, the and then you take the end of it, and you let the rest of it just drop. Come to the very top of the piece of fabric. I'm going to go over and under. Yep. Okay. And then you're going to go on. Once you do it once, you have the rhythm, and it just flows. Now, where's the fabric from? Is there a story behind it? Most of the fabric we've gotten has come from Via the Lehigh Valley. We've partnered with them for this project as a community partner. So. Their creative expressions group with, it's a subgroup within VIA. They have processed the fabric, meaning they've washed it, they've cut it for us, and they deliver it, as well as helping make rugs and looms. Um, and so they've been integral to making the project work. Uh, and also we've been taking donations. We picked up a donation this morning, and we, we have one of our auxiliary board okay. members who actually has been integral in getting us a lot of fabric. So it's all donated. No, we have not bought anything for fabric. All the fabric has been donated. So it's truly that community Absolutely. effort and impact. And, and it, you can see somebody, when we first started, somebody joked that I just donated something to the to VIA and it looks like that. And I said, well, it probably is that. <laughs> wow. So people what you gave them would end up in a rug that you might have worked on at some point or another. It's a great family project. It is a great family project. No batteries needed, right? That's right. <laughs> Level and it included. actually does force you to talk to people. And Jill, Jill talks about that a lot when we go out to do events about dialogue. And opening up stories and right. conversations. I think that, for okay. me as an artist, the project really speaks to that, uh, that place that it's time to connect and take okay, a little time out to reflect yeah. and okay. be in the moment with each other. And so this is a way to do that and get new stories, sharing new stories. Um, using the fabric is also a very accessible material for people. Fabric holds stories, so people immediately have things to share just by the use of the material that the project is designed around. And what are the ages and the experiences that people are having using these? We've been, we've had as young as two years old with the help of, of his mother was weaving. And we also have gone all the way up to 100 um, at uh, Cedarbrook in Fountain Hill. One of the residents there was 100 and weaving on the project. And what's the final goal for the project? What's the outcome? The final goal is to connect people from the Lehigh Valley in conversation about making and art and at the culmination of the exhibition on the 11th of October we are taking all of the rugs that have been woven in the community since really since February and we're going to take them out in front of the museum on the Arts Park lawn unroll the all of the segments to reveal this great tapestry of community showcasing the handwork by the day that we close, we will probably have close to 350 rugs. Yeah. <laughs> and um, what's been really important for the museum in this is that we've 
we've used this as a way to open ourselves up to the community and ask community members to help us make something. Also, lets them come into the museum and say, I helped make that and have some ownership of the project, which I really like. I like this idea that when they come back a second time, which they will, I hope, that they can say, I helped make something in this museum. Mm -hmm. I helped make art in this museum, which is a different thing than maybe people generally associate sure. with the Allentown Art Museum. It's a little bit more touchy, feely, a little more warm. It's, it's something that we really want to embrace, that we're open and please come in. Well, thank you for bringing this to us and uh, thank you for letting us contribute to it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week. Until then, remember to focus on what matters. <laughs>